I'm going to start the seismic part of this class with a, uh, some examples of uh, my work in earthquake hazard reduction, where I've been generating earthquake waves uh, in a computer through uh, uh, structures um, and uh, principally the, uh, the basins that underlie most of Nevada's cities. And I think uh, what this will do is uh, tell you a little bit about what the uh, earthquake waves uh, are uh, uh, likely to do, how they propagate, and when they're uh, larger and when they're smaller. So um, then we'll start to see how we can use those uh, waves, uh, not necessarily from earthquakes, but from artificial sources to uh, uh, be able to probe the earth and figure out actually uh, what some of these basin structures are that are uh, so um, uh, uh, put us at such a risk for uh, earthquake damage uh, here in Nevada as well as in California and Japan and other places. Now the um, the grayscale image in front of you is a uh, shaded relief map of the basin that underlies Reno, and I'm uh, pointing up here. Um, UNR is about uh, here in the northern part um, of the middle of the basin. This is the Sparks Basin over here, which is about 600 meters deep. And then um, under West McCarran and um, Mayberry, um, the Reno Basin gets to be about uh, uh, a kilometer deep. Uh, there's also some pieces of the basin that are down here under uh, South Meadows. And uh, those areas. And four years ago, four and a half years ago, we had a series of earthquakes that uh, shook the western neighborhoods of Reno. And this uh, sort of colored blob here is some of the waves that uh, were coming out of that uh, uh, earthquake. So this is a model that was made in the uh, uh, in, in computer clusters. And uh, then we propagate earthquake waves through that model, and let's observe what the uh, what the waves do, and then uh, we'll be able to come back and, and think about how we can use those wave propagation effects, and try to learn something about the uh, the Earth structure, uh, not just from earthquake waves, but from waves that uh, we can put into the ground ourselves. So I'm going to play this movie, and you're going to see the waves expand rapidly through. Uh, the area around uh, Reno, and there's this uh, curious effect that um, a lot of the wave energy is left uh, sitting within those basins that underlie the urban areas. And that's why um, uh, places such as uh, Mexico City and Tokyo and um, Kobe uh, have uh, shaken so, uh, so terribly in uh, the earthquakes that have, that have hit them. Now, uh, as I go through this movie more slowly, let me uh, rewind it back and collapse the waves back into the, the Mogul earthquake source in uh, let's see, what was that? April, in April 25th, uh, 2008. Then, um, so here the waves are just starting to hit the surface of the Earth. And if we uh, roll this forward now, uh, You'll see it's a, a very it's a very complex wave, I and mean, we try to use simpler waves when we do seismic exploration. But um, uh, these uh, more complicated earthquake waves, they still obey some of the many of the same features of uh, wave propagation that uh, we'll use in in exploration. So uh, the wave expands across the map. Uh, yeah, I forgot to say this is a map view. And you can see uh, there's some sort of dim waves out here that are um, uh, traveling faster than the others. And there's brighter waves that, with higher amplitude that are, um, that are behind. In this class, uh, we're going to start out by looking at these first arriving waves that, that travel faster. Those are called P waves. And uh, later on, we will take some advantage of the uh, um, the slower traveling waves called uh, shear waves or surface waves uh, or S waves. So we can watch, uh, you know, even by the fourth or fifth frame, the P waves are pretty much propagating 
out of the uh, frame of calculation here. And what we're looking at are principally the S waves. And it's principally the S waves that are getting caught uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the basins. This is a kind of interesting frame right here because you can see that uh, the, uh, the basin is somehow uh, bending and uh, actually delaying the waves. You know, even the P wave here and the S wave over here, you know, those are uh, being uh, caught at the edge of the basin. And it's clear that the waves don't propagate as uh, fast within the basin as they do um, outside the basin. And you can see that here, you know, the uh, nice uh, circular S wave path outside the basin, the S wave wave front actually, um, you know, looking down at, at the map view of it. And here in Sparks, where there's a, a basin, uh, you know, the, the uh, nice circular path is distorted and, and the wave arrivals delayed a little bit, you know, maybe just 5% or so uh, of its overall time. Uh, and the, whereas the P waves may be uh, even delayed somewhat more, you know, little scraps of P wave left there in the basin. Uh, same thing over here too. Uh, that's in uh, Pleasant Valley, southeast side of Reno. Uh, so in addition to the waves being uh, stronger within the basin, uh, they're also delayed. And this speaks to a uh, rock property that we call velocity. Um, which has uh, a lot to do with the strength of the rock. The, the stronger uh, and less uh, bendable, uh, less compressible the, uh, uh, the rock, uh, you know, the more force you have to use to compress it, the higher the, the moduli of deformation, then um, the faster the waves will, uh, will travel. So you know, outside the basins where you have uh, hard volcanics and uh, Sear and granite. Uh, that's uh, the the waves are traveling uh, fairly fast, uh, and these wave speeds are on the order of uh, three to uh, six kilometers per second. Uh, but uh, in the um, in the basins, uh, the velocity might even be half of what it is um, outside the basin, and the basins, of course, are filled with uh, volcanic or in this area mostly uh, uh, clastic sediments. And those sands, gravels, uh, maybe uh, tufts and, and uh, uh, volcanic mud flows, uh, those have, they're looser, they're not as compact, they're not as dense, and they have lower seismic velocities. It's a, a property of the rock, you know, much like density. Um, so sediments have uh, lower densities and lower seismic velocities, as it turns out. Uh, they're just uh, looser and more easily compressible, more easily sheared, uh, and all that. Uh, the moduli are, are lower, and these are the delays in the waves that uh, those, those produce. Uh, so let me play this uh, uh, through again a couple more times just so you can see the delayed wave fronts and, and then the energy that gets trapped uh, at the edges of the basins. Um, because the wave fronts uh, propagate through uh, pretty quickly. And you can see some, some energy rattling around a bit uh, inside, the, uh, uh, inside the basins uh, as well. OK, so uh, that's a relatively simple map of uh, the progress of, of shaking of a, uh, of a uh, uh, earthquake waves. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple more examples. All right, so here we have a, a very complex uh, example. Um, we're looking at a, a map of, um, again, a shaded relief map showing uh, basin structure. And Elko is uh, just off the, uh, uh, the map on the lower uh, uh, left side. Uh, this uh, boundary here, above which we don't have any basin information, um, that's the uh, Nevada-Idaho border, Nevada on the south, and Idaho where we haven't just haven't put the basins in to the north. And then um, the map uh, uh, doesn't quite go to uh, the Utah border on the on the right hand side, about 200 kilometers wide. And uh, also, uh, almost five years ago now, there was a um, 
in uh, February 2008, there was a magnitude 6 earthquake in the little hamlet of Wells, Nevada, along Interstate 80, um, about um, uh, five hours uh, drive east of here. And um, you can see that this earthquake happened in this very complicated, uh, geologically complicated area where there's all these basins that uh, uh, are part of the basin and range and provide a, a very complicated uh, structure that uh, allows the wave motion to be channeled and, and refracted around. So uh, again, you see a, a colored uh, area in the middle um, where the earthquake is going to uh, begin to propagate. And let's watch the, the waves as they uh, refract around and get caught in all these uh, dozens and dozens of different basins. So you can see the waves are propagating quite slowly uh, through the sediments, the low velocity sediments of the, uh, of the basins. And um, they're propagating uh, you know, more than two times faster uh, in between the basins. But you'll notice that uh, within the basins uh, where it's soft, there's also higher wave amplitudes and more earthquake shaking. And that's uh, one of the reasons that uh, 20 uh, buildings were damaged in, in Wells, Nevada, in uh, 2008 from this, from this earthquake. Um, but you can see that, that that earthquake shaking is very strongly channeled and affected by the velocity property structure, the rock velocities that are uh, in this area and are giving us lots of, uh, um, uh, lots of refraction and delays of certain waves and catching certain waves. Uh, and others are just accelerated right out the, uh, the side of the model. Uh, so again, it's the interaction here between the, the wave propagation and the velocity property of the rocks that is really giving us uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the effects that we can look for. And, and this is, of course, important in trying to predict uh, where uh, earthquakes are going to shake and where they'll shake harder and where they'll shake not as hard and which critical facilities do we have to build to a higher standard. Um, you know, where do we have to raise insurance rates? Where can we lower insurance rates? All right. But um, uh, it's also possible to look in detail at the waves and decide how then uh, we can um, we can look at in detail at the waves and decide what they're telling us about the velocity structure. You know, when we see these high amplitude waves that are propagating slowly, then we know that we're in a basin. Uh, when we see lower amplitude waves that are propagating uh, uh, faster, then we know we're in between basins. So. We can actually uh, explore and get some idea about the structure uh, by looking at these uh, uh, waves and how they arrive um, at the at different places on on the map here. Now here is a another map which uh, is down in southern Nevada, and uh, those of you from Las Vegas, you might recognize the Las Vegas Basin. The Las Vegas Strip is here, and Ellis Air Force Base is, is up here. Uh, this is the outline of uh, the western front of Frenchman Mountain, which uh, those of you from down south will, will recognize. So the Strip is, is over here. And then uh, Boulder City is uh, right out down here. Uh, you know, we've got uh, a look at the, the basins, uh, you know, very detailed uh, look at the Las Vegas Basin and not very detailed looks at the basins that are outside the Las Vegas Basin. And uh, this is called uh, El Dorado Valley down here. And there's a fairly substantial earthquake fault, uh, which is on the northwest side of El Dorado Valley, and could produce easily a magnitude 6.5 earthquake. Uh, and there's a good fault scarp there that shows that it probably has relatively recently, just in the last couple thousand years. So what this model here investigates is, you know, where is it going to shake in Las Vegas when we have that earthquake uh, on what's called the uh, Black Hills Fault, which is actually outside Las Vegas and, and more uh, in, you know, it's close, much closer to Boulder City than uh, it is to, uh, uh, to the Strip, say, over here. 
So I'm going to let this uh, uh, propagate. Uh, look down here for the uh, initial shaking uh, due to the earthquake. There it comes, and it's getting funneled into the uh, Las Vegas basin. You can see the circular waves, you know, uh, going through the Spring Mountains, where uh, there's not a lot, there's no basins, and not a lot of uh, of this, you know, velocity property heterogeneity to uh, to sort of disturb the waves, right? So we're seeing this circular circular waves here on the map, uh, and the waves are getting obviously delayed and distorted within Las Vegas Basin. They're getting caught within the El Dorado Valley Basin, and, and especially in the deeper Las Vegas Basin, they're getting caught pretty severely. Look at the delays there. You know, it just takes longer to propagate through the slow sediments uh, with that slow velocity property. You know, maybe half the velocity of the of the others. Okay, so that's uh, that's enough uh, example of of uh, the uh, uh, the earthquake hazard calculations, um, and uh, you know how how then do we use these waves to uh, uh, to investigate um, structure? And f for instance, find out how deep basins are, and, and uh, find out uh, you know more about um, uh, you know the the that velocity property is that is that tied to anything that might be interesting? Uh, you know, can you, uh, for instance, find gold based on the velocity property? Well, the quick answer is no, but it still uh, it still can be helpful. And I have some students investigating uh, those uh, issues right now. Okay, so uh, here we're looking at an extremely simple and very very low resolution. Uh, model of um, uh, a cross section, and we're going to look at seismic wave propagation not at a map as we have, but in a cross section. So, you know, across here we have distance across the the ground surface, and then on the vertical axis in this in this view, we've got uh, depth below the uh, uh, below the surface. All right. So if I um, uh, let me let me. Uh, let the waves propagate, okay. And you see that uh, you know we've uh, now this model is uh, supposed to be only uh, 50 meters wide, so it's this is the kind of scale of the experiments that we'll do in this class. All right, so we're looking uh, you know not at a map but at a uh, at a cross section, and we start out we hit the ground at the top center you know up here, and then we. Um, we're watching the waves propagate in that in that cross section, and you've probably noticed by now that there's something here in the uh, lower right which is uh, reflecting a lot of those waves back, and that would be a uh, it's a model of a cavity like a like a tunnel or a mine at it uh, or a uh, a utility tunnel, uh, um, you know, a, a buried uh, buried services. And um, so the uh, the point of this uh, wave propagation movie is to see well what what would we, would we be looking at if we wanted to find that uh, uh, those buried utilities. All right. So let me uh, bring it back here. Okay. So you know here we've we've hit the ground and we've we've got a, a wave that is traveling. Uh, you know, radially out from uh, where we've hit the ground, and uh, here it is. Uh, you know, a, a fiftieth of a second later, probably, um, and uh, a little bit later, and you can see that it's basically starting to. Uh, you know, there's other uh, discontinuities and heterogeneities in here. You know, the velocity property is not constant here. Um, but the uh, the wavefront, you know, the let's say if I track the, you know, between the black and the uh, and the and the white, the initial white and then the black, um, you know, as I track that, uh, you know, it's basically uh, uh, semicircular here in in cross section. So the waves are propagating in a in a fairly predictable way uh, from the point where we hit the hammer on the ground surface, say uh, right up here in the center at the top. Uh, but down here, you know, where that that tunnel is, we start to see that impinging on the 
on the waves. Okay, and right here you can see that you know the waves are not propagating. Uh, you can see they're highly delayed by the tunnel. So the tunnel is full of air, um, and uh, air has a, uh, I mean, although it's uh, fast by, uh, by our standards uh, at uh, 330 meters per second, um, you know, the velocity of air is like one tenth the velocity of rock. Um, so that's a, a, big, uh, a big difference. So the uh, this white part of the wave is delayed all the way back here by the outline of the of the tunnel, and the black part of the wave is delayed back here as well. But there's another thing happening too, all right. And uh, what you'll see there as we keep going is is that the the wave is reflecting off that uh, of the top left side of the tunnel, okay. So that uh, that change in velocity. You know, takes the the energy, some of the energy, and, and in this case, a lot of the energy, uh, out of the uh, the initial wave. You know, that came straight from the hammer blow, and puts it into a reflected wave. You know, which is now instead of propagating down, it's propagating up. You actually back toward the hammer here. Okay, so uh, and then you know that gets to the surface and and reflects off the surface. Um, the uh, surface of the Earth is also a pretty good reflector. Okay, so that's uh, uh, and we'll we'll collapse that back, and uh, so that's that's the progress of these waves. And and uh, you know if we can if we can detect that reflected wave and see here it would be hitting back up the surface where we could measure it, right? So uh, if we could detect that, maybe we could use the, the time that the waves arrive and their curvature and all that. We could use that to, uh, to figure out where that tunnel is. You know, essentially kind of back calculate and collapse that. See here the reflection is at the surface, right? And if I back calculate and collapse it back you know, onto the, uh, the top of the tunnel, then um, you know, I, can, uh, I can figure out where the tunnel is. Right, I can see the the waves first uh, basically reach the surface right on top of the tunnel. So there's an indication there. You know, where does that reflection arrive earliest? Well, it arrives earliest right over the the point where, um, uh, w which would be the center of the of the reflecting structure, the center of the tunnel. So all that uh, are 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 ways that we're going to use actually. To uh, use uh, these same seismic waves, really this exactly the same as earthquake waves, but we're going to use them to uh, explore the Earth and look for, you know, buried structures and and buried uh, stratigraphy. Now here's a, another example, and what we have here is uh, a little bit more of a, of labeling. Uh, again, a, a very low resolution view. I made these a long time ago when when uh, it wasn't so easy to use computers to show these kinds of animations. Um, so we're gonna now. Now you'll notice that uh, this is more of a uh, you know crustal or maybe deep uh, oil and gas type of exploration problem, perhaps even deep geothermal. Uh, there's some unknown structure in here. Uh, within the this uh, this cross section again, we're not looking at a map. We're looking at a cross section, and across the top we've got distance out to ten kilometers. Here's where the you know we've hit the ground with something or let off a big explosion, uh, or used uh, you know active source uh, machines that uh, will vibrate the ground, and then um, this vertical axis is depth, and so the uh, uh, the depth uh, uh, is uh, you know we're looking at a one to one section here, uh, and then uh, you know the grayscale uh, gives us the amplitude of the wave. And up here on the upper left, you can see the time after the initiation, after we start hitting the ground, okay, uh, or when we uh, when we let off the uh, the charge, the seismic charge. So I'll go ahead and and let this uh, propagate. And you can see that uh, you know there's one main wave that goes down, but even after that propagates out of the uh, the field of calculation here, 
you can see there's there's other things going on. There's some reflections coming up, and it's a little hard to see, but um, you know because the there's uh, the wavelengths are kind of long compared to the model. But uh, really, it's um, uh, you can see some waves moving up, and it's those reflections and and other things uh, that are happening near the surface uh, here. There's some uh, waves that are traveling along some interface here, and uh, we'll be able to use those to figure out what the velocities are and where the reflectors are. We could actually reconstruct the the structure, you know, not in uh, tremendous detail, but in enough detail to actually make this technique useful. So uh, if I collapse it again, and here you can see there's there's one reflection coming back up. And I think I could see another reflection coming back up. The clearest uh, right here, that's another reflection that's coming back up. Um, and a whole series of different uh, reflections. Uh, and, and then there's some waves that are propagating back down from the surface of the Earth. And all of that is, uh, are things that we're going to try to figure out how to use. Um, and we'll principally do that to in our uh, in our labs, uh, we've got a, a lab first on uh, refraction and figuring out velocity. Uh, then we'll have a lab on surface waves and figuring out shear wave velocities from those waves that get so easily trapped in basins and they're so large in amplitude. And then we'll have waves that are uh, uh, then we'll have a third lab that's specifically on the on the reflections, and that's half the labs in this class. So uh, we're going to examine these different pieces of the wave field. You know, you got one one hole here with all these different kinds of waves, and uh, we're going to kind of approach it piece by piece, break it down. You know, show exactly what's useful and what you can do with each little uh, observed piece of, of wave here. Okay, so all of that, um, those examples from. Uh, uh, the earthquake hazard work that my students and I have been doing, uh, these examples of uh, waves propagating on the map and propagating across sections. So all of that, um, uh, I hope, has, has motivated us to start looking at, at these waves and, and figure out uh, what we can do with them. So first we have to des decide how to uh, describe these waves. All right, And uh, now we're in the... Uh, the seismic uh, overheads, uh, the seismic one overheads, and uh, this little illustration here uh, shows kind of a view of uh, waves propagating through a uh, a medium, and you can see it's just one kind of wave, right? This might be the uh, the fast P waves, and we might be in uh, air or water where we don't have uh, the uh, uh, the slower S waves, or maybe maybe these are just the S waves, and the fast P waves have already propagated out of the picture. Either way, uh, we can describe those those different kinds of waves in very similar um, with very similar parameters. So uh, in this um, uh, view of compressional waves, uh, we have a source. That's where the waves were let off, and we're looking. We could be looking either at a map or at a cross section. You know, it would be a and if this was a cross section, that would be a buried source. Uh, if um, this was a uh, a map, then the uh, uh, what we'd be looking at here is a uh, a source in the middle of the map. And the density of dots kind of represents uh, uh, it's it's highly exaggerated, of course, but um, uh, it's it's representing the the what happens when the compressional wave passes through the medium. All right, so you can see here behind the waves or in front of the waves, there's kind of a medium density of dots. All right, and then when the first compressional wave reaches the uh, uh, a, a particular place, the dot density is higher, and then behind that is what's called a rarefaction. The dot density goes way down. Okay. Now, um, you know how much um, how much compression and refraction, rarefaction are we really talking about here? Uh, and let's face it, um, you know the the actual strains uh, 
uh, if you've studied uh, stress and strain, um, you know the stresses and strengths are are the stresses are low and the strengths are really quite high. The moduli of rock are are really very high. The stresses are not that great, um, f not for earthquake waves, but for exploration waves, the stresses are not that great. So uh, the strains are also very small. And what we're probably looking at here is a strain, uh, a compressional uh, strain of 10 to the minus 6. Uh, you know, and if it's uh, positive 10 to the minus 6, it would be a compression. And negative, it would be a rarefaction. Now, fortunately, we have instruments that can detect these very small compressions and rarefactions very easily. You know, as I'm talking to you, there are uh, uh, compressions and rarefactions coming through the air from your computer speakers or, or uh, you know, to your eardrum from your headphones, and those compressions and rarefactions are are very small, but your ear is is sensitive. You know, they're probably uh, uh, on the order of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6. And your, your ear is perfectly capable of picking them up and characterizing them, timing them, and, and uh, doing the, uh, uh, the frequency analysis your ear does to, to figure out uh, what I'm saying. So we are, and our instrumentation is, is even more uh, sensitive. You know, 10 to the minus 8 uh, strain is no problem for us to detect. And even we have, you know, robust, relatively inexpensive, you know, field-hardened uh, instrumentation uh, that we can, you know, measure these compressions and rarefactions, you know, at 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8 uh, strain levels uh, with no problem. Okay, that's the kind of equipment we have. You'll, you'll get to use this equipment and, and measure these strains. Um, and uh, uh, you know later on, and we'll do it in the field. We'll we'll practice for that. Uh, you'll analyze the data. Now, what are we going to measure? Okay, and and I'm I'm not so interested yet in um, in measuring the exact strain. Okay, that's why I'm guessing when I'm talking about a a, a level of strain. Okay, really, what I want to see, you know, I want to look at at the this velocity property. Um, and I want to I want to decide uh, where the uh, reflectors are that are that are generating the reflected waves, and I want to decide, you know, how fast did that uh, you know zone of compression did that wave travel from the source? All right. So um, I'm 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 really not going to be too concerned about the exact level of strain, you know, which is so exaggerated here in this in this plot. Really, what I want to do is 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 time the wave and and see you know if I'm observing out here and this wave is coming toward me. So I'm observing on the right hand side here. Uh, I'm going to re make a recording that looks like this. The first compression will will come at me, and then it's going to uh, uh, rarefy. Right there's the rarefaction that's going to propagate past me next. Okay, and then it, and then the secondary compression is going to come. You know these. These waves uh, tend to organize themselves like this. There will be a whole series of of up and down motions, you know, compressions and rarefactions, and all of those uh, uh, will will take these kind of sinusoidal forms. Okay, uh, and and you'll explore uh, if you if you're a geophysics major and you take uh, uh, geophysics and geodynamics uh, 455 uh, or 655. You'll explore, uh, you know, why the uh, uh, sine waves seem to be uh, a way that waves organize themselves. Okay, so there's an upswing on the uh, 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 on the seismogram. Okay, that's a compression in this case. Downswing is a rarefaction, and then you know when the wave is passed, then it all goes back to zero. Right there's the zero line right through there. Uh, you know the the gray average. Um, uh, distance. Now look at the the lower left. Okay, I don't, I, I can't point down there, or it gets covered by the um, uh, the PDF, uh, the Acrobat uh, tool. Um, and uh, uh, you look down at the lower left, and I've written uh, some equations there, or one equation there. Okay, v equals f lambda. This is a very 
uh, basic way of describing wave motion. Uh, you might have seen it in a physics class. And I want you to, uh, to memorize this, because you're going to use this over and over again. Okay? Uh, waves travel at velocity v. Okay? So v is for velocity. Uh, and uh, waves have a frequency. You know, there's, in other words, the number of cycles per second. And the SI unit for cycles per second is, uh, or one cycle per second, is one hertz. Uh, hertz. Okay. And the um, and also waves have a wavelength. Okay. So if I measure, you know, from the the most compressed peak over here to the most compressed peak on the next uh, uh, wave, positive wave that comes by, okay, then that is one lambda, and lambda is measured in meters. Okay, It's a distance. It's a wavelength. It's a length. I could just as well, you know, there's, a, there's, there's always more positive and negative swings. I could go from the center of the negative swing to the center of the next negative swing, and that would, um, that would also give me uh, uh, the same, it ought to be pretty much the same lambda, okay? Wavelength, you know, Greek letter lambda for uh, length L. Uh, another way to do it is, is to take, you know, this first departure from, uh, from you know, normal particle separation, you know, zero, uh, zero change on the seismogram, okay? We go over the top and then uh, across the, uh, the trough, and then here we're going up again, and we go. We, you know, there's a there's an instant there where we have normal particle se separation. Okay, so uh, uh, looking at the seismogram, it's easier to see this. Okay, we have normal particle separation. It gets bumped up, you know, to the peak. We swing swing back, and okay, briefly we got normal particle separation again, and we go through the negative, and then we come back to the normal particle separation. You know, on the way up, but. You know, very briefly, we're we're at normal particle separation. So this is between here and here. That's also one lambda. So we can measure peak to peak, we can measure trough to trough, or we can measure from zero crossing to zero crossing. Okay, pretty. You know, we'll get slightly different values. You know, different estimates of lambda, but uh, like with any data set, right? There's uncertainties and and a distribution of values, but it's going to be about the same. Okay, now um, uh, so so uh, you know there's this uh, this uh, uh, cardinal rule here that I want you to memorize. Uh, the velocity is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Okay, and then um, uh, so that's a very basic way. You know the velocity of prop of the wave propagation. The frequency of the waves, uh, the wavelength of the waves. Okay, uh, those are basic parameters that we use to measure waves. And then uh, you can see that they're related, right? If if I knew two of them, if I knew the frequency and the and the wavelength, I could calculate the velocity. If I knew the velocity and I knew the frequency, well, I could I could take the velocity and divide it by the frequency, and I would get lambda. Okay. Uh, so uh, you know that's the useful thing about having a relationship between these parameters, right? Uh, if you only got two, you can get the third. You know by by calculating it. Okay. Now here's a uh, <clears throat> a relationship from optics that I'm sure uh, you've all heard of before. Okay, this is the reflection of waves, and what we're looking at here is a, a cross section. All right, and um, uh, let me just get it to uh, center. Now I can't blow it up that much. All right, so um, we're looking at a, uh, a cross section, and this uh, there's this horizontal line through the middle of it, right? Okay, and then this dashed line here is perpendicular to that horizontal line. So it's like we're down in a trench and we're uh, we're looking at uh, you know, maybe we've got sand above and gravel below. You know, or or diata. You know, you might find in Reno diatomite above and um, uh, clay below, for instance. Okay, so uh, uh, imagine you're looking at this cross section, and you know, here's the uh, the boundary between 
the two uh, the two different units. Okay, so um, we have a, a wave that hits from somewhere up above. Okay, so up at the top of the trench, maybe we hit the ground, and the waves propagate uh, uh, along, and we're tracking you know one little piece of energy as it as it gets toward the boundary, and then it hits the boundary right there. Okay, and then uh, it's going to reflect. All right. Now uh, uh, you probably already know from optics uh, and uh, physics class that um, it reflects at the same angle alpha here that it came in at. The incident wave was uh, its 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 path, you know, the ray path it's called, is at the same angle alpha from the normal. Right, that dashed line is the normal. It's perpendicular to the to the interface. Uh, as the reflected wave, the reflected wave is going to propagate out this way, okay, and the uh, uh, it's got the same alpha from the normal. All right, so that's a P wave coming in and reflecting to a P wave at the same angle. Okay, now when you get a reflection, well, you get a reflection when you have some sort of interface. That means the the properties below are not the same as the properties above. Up above, we've got Density one, rho one. That's the Greek letter rho, if you can see it. And uh, velocity, p velocity one. Down below, we've got a different density, rho two, and p velocity two, vp two. Uh, it happens also. We're going to say oh, there's there's also a difference in s velocity. And we have vs one above and vs two below. Okay, so clearly we have uh, uh, we've we've got um, um, you know the the row the densities are different, the p velocity is different, the s velocity is different, and that's very normal. You know when you got two different kinds of rocks, it's so easy to get uh, two very different. Uh, uh, it's easy to have all these properties be different. Okay. Now uh, uh, you might ask, you know, does all of the energy, you know, the incident p wave, does it completely reflect? From the uh, uh, from this interface, you know, I already told you that the surface of the Earth is also a reflector, and you saw that there was uh, nearly complete reflection from that uh, uh, from that tunnel, okay, that had air in it, you know, buried in you know down inside the rock, okay. Well, you can calculate the uh, the amount of uh, the amplitude of reflection, okay. The amplitude of reflection is is a sub r. And you have the amplitude of the incident wave, okay, and you multiply it by this factor here, and this factor is the difference between, okay, it's rho two times v vp two minus rho one times vp one, okay. Uh, you might you might have heard the uh, uh, the term seismic impedance, all right. The a seismic impedance, uh, an acoustic impedance, actually. Is the density times the velocity? Okay, so medium one here, we're taking um, we're taking rho one and multiplying it by vp one, and that uh, that means that 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 uh, product is the uh, the seismic impedance of the medium one, and medium two, okay, also is a seismic impedance impedance, which is rho two uh, times uh, Vp two, all right. So that's the acoustic impedance. So we're taking the difference of the acoustic impedances. Well, what's on the denominator here? Well, that's the sum of the acoustic impedance, right? So um, you know, if they were, uh, uh, if if row two was equal to row one and Vp one was equal to Vp two, right? They're, they had the same rock on both sides, same rock above as we had below, no difference. Then uh, you know these two would subtract perfectly, and uh, there'd be zero left up up on top, which mean the means the amplitude of the reflected wave would be zero. That kind of makes sense. There's no there's no contrast in density or velocity. There's no contrast in impedance. There's no reflection. Okay, and here this this says that amplitude is is zero. Now now this uh, this simple equation here is strictly true only when uh, the the angle is zero, right? It's 
coming right, the, the wave is coming straight down along the normal and bounces straight back up. And uh, then you get this simple equation here that just involves the, the acoustic impedances. OK. So, you know, and then you can see the more difference there is between the acoustic impedances, then the stronger that, that reflected wave will be. OK. So, you know, it's going to be easy for us to uh, record reflections from, you know, strong impedance contrasts, you know, maybe where the velocity and the density are both like half in the sediment uh, as they are for the granite below. Okay. And that's going to give us, you know, sediment against granite. That gives us a pretty good impedance contrast and nice strong reflections. If you just go from, you know, fine sand to coarse sand, yeah, there will be some impedance contrast, but maybe it'll only be, you know, three percent or five percent. Okay. And in that case, then we get a reflection coefficient of, you know, maybe uh, uh, two to four percent, which is uh, still detectable in, in many situations, and we can go after that. All right, but it's going to be you know more difficult to find that reflection than to find a very strong uh, uh, reflection from a strong impedance contrast like the bottom of a sedimentary basin. Now there's also uh, 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 an equation here that tells you how the S wave reflects, and uh, uh, the thing you should know is that when you have a, a P wave hitting a reflector like this. Then, uh, uh, yeah, the p the reflected p wave is at exactly the same angle alpha alpha equals alpha, um, but the reflected s wave, and and the first thing you, you need to realize is that okay, an incident p wave will will you know partly reflect and some of it reflects as p wave, but then a lot more of it actually in in most situations will reflect as an s wave. So uh, that's another thing to, uh, to watch out for. Now, uh, I said that that uh, reflection coefficient is only good for um, the, uh, uh, the angle of incidence being, uh, being perfectly vertical, you know, zero, OK? Uh, you know, zero uh, angle from the normal to the reflector. And here's uh, an exploration of what happens, uh, you know, for some typical reflector when it's not zero. Okay, um, so we begin at zero with a, you know, here that looks like a maybe seven percent reflection coefficient. All right, and uh, you go uh, the the this horizontal scale here is the angle of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, reflection. Or, or the alpha angle, okay, and uh, so you start at at, at uh, some you know low amount of reflection, you know under ten percent, and it can waver around a little bit, and then suddenly you get to uh, a certain angle, which here is uh, about 30, uh, 37 degrees, and the the reflection amplitude jumps way up, okay. So sometimes it's very useful to try to look at uh, larger angle reflections because they can be a lot stronger and a lot easier to record than uh, these normal, uh, you know, zero angle reflections. And then um, the uh, it, it will drop, you know, if you if you go out to larger angles, uh, and then gradually rise, uh, you know, to uh, uh, 1.0. Okay, at one at a reflection coefficient of 1.0, that means that the entire energy, incident energy, all of it is reflected. You know, none of it passes into the uh, uh, into the medium below. Okay, well that, that's what the these lower plots are. They're telling you the relative amplitude, the the uh, the transmission coefficient. Okay, or or the refraction coefficient. So it begins at uh, you know if this is seven percent, then it uh, it might start at uh, uh, at uh, three percent, uh, or I'm sorry, ninety-seven percent, right? And then it stays pretty steady for this typical reflector, whatever it is. And then when it gets to that critical angle, okay, it drops to zero. And notice that uh, beyond the critical angle, there is no P wave energy that gets into the the no. There's no amplitude zero 
exactly that gets into the lower median that's refracted down. Okay, and that's uh, you know why there's all this energy for the the critical reflection. Now, why doesn't the the P wave reflection coefficient jump up to one? Well, there's that that division of the energy. Some of it gets reflected as shear wave energy, and some of it is refracted as shear wave energy. Okay, and all of them have the cusp right at the critical angle. Uh, at least that stays the sa that stays the same in all four plots. Okay, so that's a a, a bit on uh, reflection, and uh, uh, so where we have a sudden change in the uh, in the properties, right? We, that's where we'll have a uh, a non-zero reflection coefficient. Now, how do those waves propagate? And uh, how do we figure out what the velocity is, right? How does uh, how do the waves propagate, uh, and uh, can they get disturbed by uh, other mechanisms than than reflection? And that's uh, encapsulated in this in this uh, uh, these statements called Fermat's principle. Um, and Fermat's principle is the wave path between any two points. Is the one along which the time of travel is the least of all possible paths. Okay, it doesn't say it say it's the shortest path. It says it's the least time. Okay, the time of travel is the least. All right. So Fermat's principle is also called the principle of least time. All right. So let's look at a cross section here. Uh, you know, much like that um, that cross section with the tunnel in it. Um, and um, we'll set off a seismic, um, uh, 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 some seismic waves at the uh, um, uh, at the at the surface, okay, up here and and in the center, all right. And um, uh, everywhere in this cross section, it has the same seismic velocity property. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna think about it. In a very simple way, right? Uh, everywhere is the same velocity, so the wave, you know, isn't delayed by any basins or or reflections or anything. There's no changes in the in the velocity property, right? And so, you know, the wave at I don't know, point uh, one second is there, point two seconds it it's there, point three seconds. We're kind of looking here at a um, a view of the wave fronts, right? And then it gets to our receiver that we've put down in a well or something down here, uh, at a um, at a at a distance, and and if we you know at some depth, okay. Now if we track back the energy that got to that receiver, we would track it back perpendicular to the wave fronts, back to the source, right? So we would climb up the hill as as uh, steeply as we could. Okay, and track it, track it back to the source. The ray path is perpendicular to the wave front. Okay, now where velocity is constant, the ray paths are uh, are circular, and the wave fronts are straight. You know they're perfectly. I'm sorry, the <laughs> I said it the other. I said it the wrong way. The uh, the wave fronts are circular, where velocity is constant. The velocity property of rocks. Okay, the wave fronts are, are circular. The ray paths are radial and perfectly straight. Okay, now here's a here's a situation where we have high velocity on the right hand side of the cross section, low velocity on the left hand side of the cross section. Or if you like, you know, you could make this a map uh, as I was showing you at the beginning, uh, and. Uh, you know, maybe we have a basin on the left and and bedrock on the right. Okay. So uh, you know, in the high velocity part, the ray paths are 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 uh, circular. Okay, but then they you know those those circles run into the low velocity part. Then what happens? Well, you can see the low velocity part has the same circles. Okay, but they're closer together, right? It's like uh, you know, one wavelength here is twice what it is in the high velocity. It's twice what it is in the low velocity. Okay, 
the velocity is like half. It takes twice as much time to get anywhere uh, on the left side as it does on the right. So the um, um, uh, so these contours are now kind of complicated, right? And uh, Fermat's principle says, all right, the least time path, uh, and it's you know it's this is actually quite hard to calculate. Uh, and and why uh, you know waves just follow it they just do it um, it'll propagate along the interface just inside the high velocity area and then it will light out here where it will find that least time path and you can see the least time path is still perpendicular to the um, to the rate to the uh, wave fronts okay and uh, it it turns right there where it refracts. And so we're seeing that uh, you know this part right here. These are are circular up here at the top, but at the bottom, you know, we're looking at these straight refractions. All right. So this is not the shortest path from the source to the receiver. It's the least time path. Okay. It's it's like the uh, uh, it's like spending as much you know going out of your way to spend as much time on the freeway as possible. Over the city streets. Okay, so here you know we're on the high velocity freeway, and then we take an exit, you know that's essentially closest and drops right, right down the um, uh, perpendicular to the wave fronts, um, uh, drops uh, down along the least time path to our receiver. Okay, and if I had a receiver over here, right, I I you know climb the wave fronts. To get back to the source, if I had a receiver over here somewhere else, you know, I climb the wave fronts to get back to the source, keeping the path perpendicular to the uh, uh, to the wave front. All right, Fermat's principle. Okay, now what we'll be able to do is is predict how Fermat's principle will work from this. This uh, relationship that you you're familiar with from optics, called Snell's law, and the part I want to discuss first is just where I have an incident P wave, okay, that's traveling at VP one, and here again, you know, we're looking at the trench wall here or something. We've got, you know, one medium, the medium number one above, medium number two below. Above we have row one, density one, VP one, VS one. Below we got Row two, VP two, VS two. Okay, and we have a um, um, we have a, uh, an incident wave at some angle uh, i or uh, uh, or alpha. Okay, and there's all these other waves. There's the reflected waves, right? To uh, the reflected P wave is uh, comes out at i, as we found out. But where does the refraction come out? All right, Snell's law allows us to calculate that. Okay, so um, all right, the uh, the P wave uh, incident angle is alpha, and so Snell's law says that sine alpha over P VP one is equal to right alpha is in the medium VP one, and uh, and that ratio is equal to sine beta over VP two. Okay. Now, um, you may have seen Snell's law in the context of optics before, where instead of, of velocity, you used uh, index of refraction. And here, I think um, it'll be clear that the velocity is uh, proportional to the inverse of the index re of refraction. Okay? So that's why, you know, for angle alpha being in medium 1, we divide it by the velocity, and angle beta Okay, here for the P wave, being in in medium two, we divide it by the velocity in medium two. Okay, and you know depending on what wave we're looking at at what different angle, you know it depends on what the velocity is in that medium uh, for that kind of wave. All right. So uh, Snell's law, another good one to memorize. Uh, you know, just in its its form, right in the right in the middle here, where um, uh, we're only concerned about P waves. 
Okay, so let's let's look at Snell's law a little bit more closely, right? Um, where um, uh, and we're just we'll just look at it for P waves only, and in fact we'll forget about the reflection for a sec and and uh, and uh, think about the uh, the refraction only. So again, we're looking at our trench wall. We've got this horizontal interface. <coughs> Sorry, the slide wasn't straight. And we got the incident P wave coming in at angle alpha from the normal to the to the ref, to the interface, uh, the refracting interface, and we've got uh, a refracted P wave, you know, a transmitted P wave, which has come through the the interface and uh, is headed on down, but at a different angle, beta, right? There's the angle beta, right there. All right, so. Um, uh, we just apply Snell's law, right? And above we have uh, VP one. Below we have VP two, right? So the sign we want to, you know, we want to start with an angle alpha above. We want to get the angle beta below, right? We start with alpha. We take its sign. We multiply it by VP two, divide by VP one, right? We work out Snell's law that way, and solving for the sign of beta, right? Then you can get that right. So if you want to solve for beta, you uh, you take uh, the sine of the incident angle, you uh, multiply it by VP two, divide by VP one, and that gives you the the sine of uh, of beta. And you just so you just take that uh, the uh, the inverse sine, the arc sine, and that will give you the angle beta. <clears throat> um, but there's a uh, uh, an effect here, okay. Let's consider as we keep increasing alpha, okay. So we get uh, uh, an incident angle, right? Notice notice here um, the uh, we have uh, an incident wave, okay. It's at alpha, and beta is larger. All right. So what does that mean? Okay, so uh, uh, sine alpha was multiplied by VP two over VP one, and we got a larger sine, which led to a larger angle beta. All right. So uh, uh, what that meant was that VP two was greater than VP one, right? Because this ratio here had to give more than one because sine beta is more than sine alpha. Right, so VP two is greater than VP one. All right, so let's come back down here to this slide. All right, and uh, so we have, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, row one and V one, and there's row two and V two. All right, we'll start. We'll stop talking about uh, VP and just whatever uh, kind of wave, and assume it's, uh, you know, in this class it's just fine to assume it's a P wave velocity. Okay, so we keep we start increasing uh, VP. Uh, uh, we start increasing alpha, and beta is larger, and eventually beta hits ninety degrees, right? And uh, then what happens, right? Does it make any difference? You know uh, what? Uh, whether we keep increasing it after that? Well, no. Uh, so when does that happen, right? That that happens when uh, when beta. Uh, is 90 degrees, okay? Then sine 90 degrees is, um, uh, you know, the sine alpha or sine 90 degrees, right? Is going to be v1 over v2, and um, so sine 90 degrees is what? It's one, right? Um, you know, sine of zero degrees is uh, zero, but sine 90 degrees is one, okay? So here, what we, you know, after putting in that one. Right, we can just cross that out, and we have sine alpha is equal to v one over v two, so that's the alpha at which the beta first goes to ninety degrees. The refracted angle first goes to ninety degrees. Okay, so we'll call that particular alpha, we'll call it the critical angle, or alpha sub c. So if you have v one over v two, you can get the critical angle because the sine of the critical angle, the sine of alpha sub c, is equal to v one 
over v2. Okay. Now, let's suppose we had the other. Um, you know, this is where v1 is less than v2, right? v2 was greater. All right. What if v2 was greater? I, I'm sorry. What if v2 was less than v1? All right. If v2 was less than v1 in this ratio here in, in calculating the sine of the critical angle, uh, the ratio would be greater than 1. Can you have a sine of any angle that's greater than 1? No, you can't. So that means there is no critical angle. Okay? There's no refraction. No matter what you make alpha sub c, no matter what you make alpha, the incident angle, you're never going to get that, that refracted angle beta to 90 degrees. Okay, if uh, if v one is greater, then uh, uh, then alpha will always be greater than beta. Okay, that's just that's the way it has to work. So here, uh, you know, there's only a critical angle when it's higher velocity below. Okay, that's the only way there's a critical angle. All right. So now let's uh, you know now now we know a little bit more about how waves are going to propagate. Um, uh, when there are changes in the velocity, and so I want to start talking about this velocity property. What you know what makes some rocks low velocity and what makes other rocks uh, high velocity. Okay. Um, now I haven't given you a, a section on elastic constants. Um, but um, you may be familiar, uh, especially the geological engineers, may be familiar with uh, elastic constants such as the incompressibility, which uh, I call k, or the um, uh, the rigidity, uh, which I which I call mu. Okay, and uh, these are seismologists' uh, terms. <coughs> We've got the density uh, rho here. Okay. And the p-wave velocity is equal to the square root of the quantity uh, k, which is the uh, the incompressibility, plus four thirds times the rigidity, okay, mu, and divide all that by rho, and then take the square root. You've got the p-wave velocity. All right. So it's clear here that that you know the the uh, the higher the moduli k and and rho. The higher the incompressibility, the higher the rigidity, the higher the p-wave velocity is going to be. Okay, uh, but what's weird is that density is on the the denominator. Okay. Um, now this uh, uh, so what gives there right for a higher density right the denominator is going to be larger. That means the ratio will be less and the velocity will be less. Well, this is for a. Uh, uh, you know this relationship works best for a single crystal, or for a, 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 you know a massive um, um, a massive kind of uh, um, uh, material, right? So uh, you could make this relationship work for uh, uh, massive concrete. You know that's very well cemented. Okay, uh, the uh, the the higher the the density. The lower the velocity. Okay, um, so very light concretes that are made out of, uh, uh, you know, very uh, uh, light uh, aggregate, you know, like cinders, uh, will have uh, uh, higher velocities, higher uh, uh, p wave velocities than um, than denser concretes. Okay, and aluminum, for instance, a block of aluminum will have a higher velocity. Than uh, a block of steel, right? Because the uh, um, for aluminum and steel, say the uh, well, okay. Let me talk uh, titanium and and steel. Titanium and steel have roughly the same um, uh, k and, and mu, uh, but titanium is quite a bit lighter. Just like aluminum is a lot lighter, and so the lighter material, uh, the lighter massive material, will have a a uh, higher velocity, but that doesn't work. Okay, that doesn't work when you go to uh, um, materials like like rocks. Okay, 
uh, materials that are granular, that have pore space, that have fractures. Um, you know, this works on single crystals, and uh, we've got to include some other factors when we're talking about real rocks. Okay, uh, so what really affects water velocities? Okay, uh, as water saturation goes up, as as air gets replaced by water, okay, in the pore space of a rock or a soil, the velocity will go up. Okay, as a rock becomes more consolidated, as we as we weld the grains together with cements like uh, calcite cement or quartz cement, uh, opal cement, right? As consolidation consolidation uh, increases velocity because you know welding those grains together is going to vastly uh, and hugely increase the uh, uh, the K and mu, right? Uh, you know you weld the grains together and the K and mu can go up by a factor of ten, right? You weld the grains together, you replace pore space by cement. Yeah, you do take the uh, the density up too. Uh, but how much is the density going to go up? You know, maybe twenty percent, thirty percent at most, right? If you got a whole lot of pore space to to you know to fill with uh, cement, yeah. So the the density does you know goes up by ten percent, whereas K and mu are are increasing by a factor of ten. Yeah, the uh, the velocity is going to go up. Okay, consolidation velocity goes up. All right, so uh, uh, you know you desaturate a uh, um, you know you re you take the you lower the water table and uh, uh, and the velocity will go down. Okay. Also, you know what's the opposite of consolidation? Well, uh, either f weathering or fracturing, right? So weathering takes velocity down. So soils typically have uh, lower velocities than rock, and fracturing takes velocity down, right? Because you're uh, breaking those bonds between the grains, and you know drastically lowering the K and mu. Okay, so here's some some materials uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with, some rocks and, and other materials, and uh, and and I'm giving you here the ranges of uh, of uh, VP P wave velocity acoustic velocity. In uh, units of kilometers per second, right? So um, you'd have to, um, you know, to get feet per second, um, you've got to uh, multiply uh, by about, uh, uh, you know, to get kilofeet per second, you'd multiply by uh, a little more than three. All right. So um, and it's good, uh, you know, in industry. Um, and commercial work, uh, consulting work, you know, feet per second is the rule. Uh, in uh, uh, in scientific work, in research, in academia, uh, you know, we're using uh, meters. So uh, just have to get used to both systems. So this is all in uh, <clears throat> in kilometers per second. Okay. So let's look first at the consolidated materials. You know, it's a little bit simpler story. All right, so granite is, uh, you know, not, and I'm not talking. I'm talking about good solid Sierra granite. I'm not talking about fractured uh, granite. I'm not talking about faulted granite. I'm not talking about decomposed granite. Right? I'm talking about solid granite. Okay, five to six kilometers per second P wave velocity. Okay, so um, uh, not a huge range. Um, you know, for solid granite, and pretty fast, right? Um, basalt, faster still, five point four to six point four. You know, uh, and that's for uh, you know solid basalt. Okay, not uh, not fracture basalt, not a not a not a basalt flow. You know, that's been that's got columnar uh, joining in it. Uh, solid basalt. Okay. Um, metamorphic rocks, you know, a Sierra and roof pendant. Well, big range, right? Um, 3.5 to 7.0, you know, factor of two, easy. Okay. Um, sandstone and shale. Okay, so these are are you know basin basin fill materials. You know, much lower than granite, much lower than basalt. 
um, maybe not lower than maybe not much lower than than grander basalt. Uh, lower, but not maybe not much at the upper end here. Um, and uh, you know there are some metamorphic rocks uh, that are old and buried and solid, but they're still lower velocity than than some of the uh, some of the younger uh, sandstones and shales. Okay, big range, limestone even bigger range. Okay, and, and what this range is telling you is that for that very rare you know solid hard massive limestone. Uh, you know, like the red wall limestone, uh, you know, just back behind the Grand Canyon, okay, and away from any faults. It's as it's as uh, it's as fast as bas as uh, basalt as basalt. It's as fast as granite, six point zero kilometers per second. But um, uh, down in uh, uh, you know where it's faulted or or weathered or it's got uh, cavities in it from dissolution, very low velocity, two point zero, okay. Just hard to get that uh, that really massive and un, uh, undissolved limestone. All right, so now let's look at uh, well, okay. One more thing I want to mention: if I say the velocity is uh, 6.0, right? You've got a lot of choices. Okay, can you can you say it's it's limestone? No. Can you say it's metamorphics? No. Uh, you can't say it's basalt. You can't say it's granite. Right? 6.0. That could be any of those four. Okay, if I say the velocity is 2.0, well, uh, yeah, it's not. It's not going to be granite. It's not going to be basalt. It's not going to be metamorphics. Uh, but it's sandstone or shale. Could be either one. Okay, uh, and uh, and could be limestone. Could be you know fractured buggy limestone too. Um, so so what does that mean? That means that that the velocity is not unique. You know, none of these materials have a unique velocity. The um, when you get a velocity value, which is what we're going to be measuring a lot, you know, with our seismic surveys, we're going to be getting velocity values. It doesn't tell you which material you have. It's not enough. Okay, gotta gotta we got to look at a whole bunch of other properties to to be sure. Okay. So uh, you know, and it's even worse with the unconsolidated materials, right? Um, when we do seismic surveys, we talk about the "quote unquote" weathered layer. Okay, that's the soil, or it could be deeper than the soil. Okay, but it's you know whatever is above the water table, and so it's uh, you know 0.3 to 0.9 kilometers per second, 300 to 900 meters per second. It's something that you might just label as soil, quote unquote. Okay. 0.25 to 0.6. Okay, uh, alluvium. We got a lot of that around here. That that has a huge range, right? 0.5. I've seen plenty of alluvium uh, that slow up to 2.0, maybe even higher, maybe 2.5 in some cases. You know, these ranges are out of the book, and and uh, we've seen even larger ranges. Uh, and then when the alluvium gets cemented by uh, caliche or or calcite cemented. Uh, you know, if you're from Las Vegas you're, and you've ever tried to dig in your yard, you've probably encountered this calcrete, okay, this caliche. All right. Uh, you know, if you're lucky in your yard, you've got softer caliches with a velocity of only 2.0. That's bad enough. But uh, you know, when it gets really cemented and really thick, it can go up to 6.0, right? As hard as as the hardest limestone. Uh, so. Titanic, you know, factor of three in velocity range there. Uh, whatever you might call clay, you know, one point one to two point five, big range, factor of two. Unsaturated sand, okay, that can be really low in velocity, and we we might measure that at certain places, okay, uh, down to to two hundred meters per second, 0.2 kilometers per second. Up to uh, you know unsaturated sand, sand, uh, uh, you know really soft, really loose. It doesn't get above one kilometer per second. Saturated sand, though, you know if it's partially saturated, it can be down as low as uh, 0.8 kilometers per second, and as high as 2.2 kilometers per second. Yeah, in some gravel, you, you you can raise the velocities a little bit, but you know maybe not maybe not distinctly so. Okay, saturated sand and gravel, you know. It's uh, 
uh, another huge range of velocity, depending on the saturation in that case. Uh, glacial till, where you take that sand and gravel and you add a bunch of clay, right? that can lower the velocity uh, just because it just says 1.7 kilometers per second for saturated till doesn't mean that uh, that's all it could be. Um, but maybe there isn't a huge range there. You know, okay, well then you compact it and it can go up to 2.1. Now, um, uh, so here, here uh, you know, it's clear that saturation has a big effect uh, on the velocities of unconsolidated materials, especially. Okay, and why is that? All right. Well, here's here's the velocity of some fluids. All right. So uh, uh, one thing about uh, fluids, they basically, by definition, have a shear velocity of zero. Right. So I I said shear velocity is defined to be zero for any fluid. All right. Some common fluids that we'll encounter in our surveys are water and air. They're they're, they're both fluids. Okay. Water has a velocity that uh, you know varies from um, 1.4 kilometers per second to 1.6 kilometers per second. 1.4 if it's um, you know fresh and hot, uh, and 1.6 if it's cold and 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 quite briny. You know most water is really very very close to 1.5 kilometers per second in velocity. And that's one of those indicator velocities that uh, lets us figure it out. All right. Now what does this mean if we take uh, you know, uh, uh, sand particles or quartz, right? So they're going to look like each sand particle has an internal velocity of between five and six kilometers per second, right? But we put it together in, in an unconsolidated, uh, uh, you know, sand, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the surface of uh, uh, of Sand Mountain, you know, just east of here. And uh, okay, if it's totally unsaturated, very very loose, like the you know, like the top layer of sand mountain on a hot day, okay, then it's going to be at uh, uh, 0.2 kilometers per second P wave velocity. Okay. Now, if we take that same loose sand and we fill it with, we fill the pore space with water, okay, so it rains on sand mountain and the water is running off sand mountain, okay, then suddenly we have saturated, completely saturated sand. And its uh, and its velocity uh, can easily be um, uh, one point five. Okay, why is that? Because it's then the the water in the pore space that's controlling the velocity of the sand. Okay, if it's very loose sand, okay, then then uh, even though the sand grains themselves are five kilometers per second internally, uh, they're still going to rub against each other, and you know the P wave uh, velocity is going to be the same as the velocity of water. There's a lot of water in that sand. Okay, same thing um, with um, uh, uh, with air saturated uh, materials. You know, you saturate a material with air. You'd think the the velocity uh, uh, couldn't get lower than the velocity of air itself, uh, which is uh, you know 0.32 to 0.34. Um, um, 0.32 to 0.34 uh, kilometers per second, um, and the higher velocity where the air is less dense, okay, uh, such as at elevation up here in Reno, uh, compared to sea level. Uh, most of the experiments I've done, you know, the the velocity of the of the air is not really noticeably different from uh, 0.33, 330 meters per second. So that's pretty good. Um, and uh, what's remarkable is that that unsaturated um, sand, even though it's still full of air, can have a lower velocity. And uh, a class a few years ago also proved that uh, uh, that unsaturated, dry, you know, very friable clay can have a similarly low velocity. I think we got a velocity of 0.22 um, for uh, for a bunch of really dry clay. All right, in a in a uh, in a canal bank, a levee. All right, so that's about the only case where we can actually get a, a rock velocity, right? Um, unsaturated sand in Sand Mountain. I mean, it's uh, it's still rock, right? 
uh, technical definition, uh, that rock velocity is less than the velocity of air. Otherwise, that velocity of air is really a floor to the uh, velocities that we can have. You know, we really don't see velocities of, of hardly anything that's as low as the velocity of air. Okay. Um, all right. You take those fluids and you uh, you freeze them, right? You take water and you freeze it. And it becomes ice, and ice is a massive uh, but fairly light, um, you know, crystal, and that uh, so it has pretty high velocity. It's pretty stiff, and it's also light and massive, and uh, so ice itself will have velocity like granite, five to six kilometers per second. Okay, snow is a sedimentary rock, right? Inorganic, uh, solid, uh, and uh, uh, made up of the mineral ice, and uh, it can have. Uh, uh, and of course, when when you're looking at, at a uh, snowbank, um, you know, like this fresh powder snow that we're all hoping for. Um, it's been uh, you know since uh, December that we've had a, a, some good powder on the slopes here, and. Uh, that powder snow, you know, it's a it is it's an extremely unconsolidated, very very loose, and it has a velocity uh, that's that's lower than uh, uh, lower than that of air. Okay, 0.2 kilometers per second. Of course, you compact the snow, as has been happening on the slopes lately, uh, with the freeze thaw cycles, and the velocity can get you know close to that of of solid ice, right? As the snow gets closer to to being solid ice. So um, uh, that's that that huge range there. You know, so snow is a, a sedimentary rock or a soil, if you like, and uh, and like 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 uh, uh, you know, classic sediments and soils has got a huge range depending on its physical condition. Just to note, on shear wave velocities, I'll, I express them here in terms of uh, of the VP the VS over VP ratio. Okay. For a massive crystalline rock, the uh, Vs over Vp ratio is about uh, one over the square root of three, or 0.6. Okay. Uh, for sedimentary rocks, it's somewhat less; it's about half. So the the shear velocity will be about half the p velocity. For unconsolidated materials, uh, it can be 0.4, or actually, I've seen it as small as uh, one fifteenth, uh, which is you know really Remarkably low, um, so the uh, you know the shear velocity can drop off very quickly in un in unconsolidated materials. Uh, here's a, a little uh, uh, a famous uh, uh, chart that can help you to uh, uh, take uh, uh, rocks that are sedimentary rocks that are uh, of interest to oil exploration. Okay, and um, uh, so here we're looking at depth in in thousands of feet. That's a uh, uh, you know the deepest wells are uh, at least in California are are uh, uh, twelve to eighteen thousand feet. Um, there's some wells that are even deeper than that in uh, in Oklahoma. Um, some gas wells, and uh, uh, there are. Uh, you know, most of the oil and geothermal wells in Nevada are going to be between three and six thousand feet deep. So, this uh, uh, this chart addresses that quite well. And the uh, and on the left hand side, the velocity is given in uh, uh, kilofeet per second, thousands of feet per second. So, uh, you know, fifteen thousand feet per second is just under. Uh, um, Five kilometers per second, right? That's the upper range. Five and six kilometers per second is is as high as these uh, sandstones and shales get. Okay, um, and so uh, you know, as you bury sandstones and shales, right? The vol the they get more uh, lithified, uh, and uh, and so the velocity goes up. That's what these individual curves are are, are showing. Okay, these are from you know tens, hundreds of thousands of measurements of velocity versus uh, uh, of velocity in, in uh, well logs. Okay, using sonic uh, uh, loggers. Okay, and the other thing that, that you might notice here is that the the uh, the youngest rocks are lower in velocity. 
Okay, the oldest rocks here are higher in velocity. And uh, if you take uh, uh, if you take uh, 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 depth of burial, that's z, and you make it in feet, and you take the age of the formation in years. Okay, so that's going to be in the millions, maybe hundreds of millions. Okay. Uh, and then here's this uh, constant k, which is uh, uh, you know when when z is in feet and t is in in years, um, then uh, uh, it's 125.3. Okay, so you take uh, uh, the depth in feet, so that's going to be thousands of feet times millions of years, and you take it to the power of one sixth, right? So you know you get uh, you get millions, but then you uh, uh, you basically uh, take its uh, sixth root, and so that gets it down to single digits again, and um, uh, or tens anyway, and you multiply it by 125.3. That's k there, and you get the the sh the p velocity in uh, uh, in feet per second. Okay. So this is a little uh, rule of thumb here that that you can easily use to try to predict. What your uh, what your uh, uh, your p velocity is going to be? You know, you might ask yourself, all right, you know, how much reflection coefficient would I see between a uh, a post Eocene sandstone and an Eocene sandstone, right? So then you and they're at the same depth, right? So you you the Eocene sandstone is what uh, 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 sixty million years old, right? So uh, uh, and your uh, your post Eocene sandstone, maybe it's uh, it's quaternary. It's only two million years old, right? So you you figure that in. You know, two million year old sandstone. You you put in two million uh, for that, and and uh, maybe you're observing it at a uh, hundred feet depth, right? So you put in z, and and uh, you get you you're going to get a value out, okay? And then you put in your um, uh, for t, you put in. Uh, 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 60 million for the Eocene sandstone. Okay, and uh, go through this, and you're going to get a higher value, right? And so then you can go ahead and and uh, see uh, whether you're going to get a reasonable reflection coefficient. Okay, one last thing uh, in today's lecture is the relationship of um, of velocity to porosity. Okay. So I, I've talked about you know how in soils and, and unconsolidated rocks, you know the saturation makes a difference, and and you know how loose and porous it is also makes a difference. And there's a, a formal relationship that you, that you can use, right? It's called this Wiley time average relationship, and um, basically uh, you factor it, you assume. You know, you have uh, uh, some kind of fluid in the pore space. You know, usually water or brine. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the velocity of the fluid, v sub f. Um, let's see. Let me let me uh, let me focus in a bit here. Yeah. So uh, uh, v sub f is the velocity of the fluid in the pore space. V sub m. Is uh, the velocity of the of the rock matrix? Okay, so you know maybe uh, we're going to try to compose a sandstone and figure its velocity. Uh, you know, loose sand is probably um, uh, uh, five kilometers per second, and uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, the uh, the sand grains themselves have an internal velocity. You know, to the extent they're massive, they have a velocity of of five kilometers per second, okay, and uh, maybe the porosity, the thirty percent porosity, is full of water, okay. And notice here that this uh, uh, this is called a time average relationship because the inverse of um, of uh, velocity is really time. And notice that we're adding up all these inverses of velocity. So we got a proportional average, right? So we take one over the velocity of the uh, um, of the of the fluid, right, and we we multiply that by the fluid fraction, which is the porosity. Okay, so maybe that's thirty uh, percent. Okay, and then we take one over the the matrix velocity, 
you know, maybe that's uh, one over five kilometers per second, and uh, we multiply that by uh, uh, point uh, um, by point uh, um, uh, by one minus the porosity, which is seventy percent. Okay, uh, so point we multiply it by point seven, add the two together, right, and that that gives us a time average. Uh, slowness, and so then we we just invert that to get the uh, uh, the time average velocity. So I think what this is telling you here is that the uh, the higher the porosity, the lower the velocity, right? We're looking at one over velocity here, and the higher the porosity, the the lower the velocity. Usually, you know, our our fluid is uh, slower than our uh, than our matrix, right? You know, one point five for water versus uh, Five kilometers per second for uh, sand grains. So uh, we can use this uh, now to see, uh, you know, how much uh, how much porosity we have. Okay, and uh, so here's uh, reciprocal velocity uh, microseconds per foot, which we get straight from a sonic log. You know, we we measure it that way, and then here is uh, porosity. Okay, and uh, you know. It's really hard to get uh, porosity above thirty percent, right? Uh, got to have some kind of uh, uh, diatomaceous earth, right? Which we got a lot of here in Reno, and it's still pretty close. Okay, these little uh, triangles right there. So, uh, and then here's uh, here's regular sandstone, right? Which can easily be zero porosity, right? If all the grains are perfectly cemented together. Okay. And uh, so we have, uh, um, you know, we start at uh, at a high at a uh, a high velocity, right? Low reciprocal velocity, right? Notice that this scale increases to the left, which is kind of weird, but uh, there it is. So high velocity at zero porosity, and then we climb up. You know, when we climb up in porosity, uh, we get, uh, uh, you know, the the Microseconds per foot is starting at, at uh, 50 here, and then by the time we get to 30 per, 30% porosity, the microseconds per foot is at uh, 100. Uh, so that's uh, you know half the velocity, right? Twice the time, half the velocity. So uh, big effect, especially in the materials that we'll be surveying in and measuring. Uh, big effect of porosity. And you can see it really counts, you know, whether you have air or water in the pores, because you know air has one fifth the velocity, the p-wave velocity of water, you know, 0.33 versus uh, 1.5 kilometers per second. Okay, so that's uh, plenty for uh, uh, this introductory seismic lecture, and uh, uh, the next lecture will continue uh, examining these basic facts of uh, seismic wave propagation.